Hi everyone, it's Cassie, the Young Teen Librarian at East Hampton Library. Tonight we are continuing reading through Cheaper by the Dozen, and we are continuing with Chapter 7, Skipping Through School. Mother saw her children as a dozen individuals, a dozen different personalities, who eventually would have to make their way separately in the world. Dad saw them as an all-inclusive group to be brought up under one master plan that would be best for everybody. What was good for Anne, he believed, would be good for Ernestine, for Bill, for Jack. Skipping grades in school was part of Dad's master plan. There was no need, he said, for his children to be held back by a school system geared for children of simply average parents. Dad made per periodic surprise visits to our schools to find out if and when we were ready to skip. Because of his home training program, spelling games, geography quizzes, and the arithmetic and languages, we sometimes were prepared to skip, but never so prepared as Dad thought we should be. The standard reward for skipping was a new bicycle. None of us liked to jump grades because it meant making new friends and trailing behind the rest of the class until we could make up the work. But the bicycle incentive was great, and there was always the fear that a younger brother or sister would skip and land in your class. That would be the disgrace supreme. So whenever it looked as if anyone down the family line was about to skip, every older child would study frantically so that he could jump ahead too. Mother saw the drawbacks. She knew that while we were advanced for our age in some subjects, we were only average or below in some intangibles such as leadership and social ability. She knew, too, that Dad, who was in his 50s, wanted to get as many of his dozen as possible through school and college before he died. As for report cards, members of the family who brought home good grades were feted and rewarded. Chip off the old block, Dad would crow. Youngest in his class, and he brings home all A's. I used to lead my class in the fifth grade, too. And I was always the one to pick and I was always the one picked to draw the turkey on the blackboard come Thanksgiving. My only bad subject was spelling. Never learned to spell until I was a grown man. I used to tell the teachers that I'd be able to hire a bunch of stenographers to do my spelling for me. Then he'd lean back and roar. You couldn't tell whether he was really bragging or just teasing you. Children who brought home poor grades were made to study during the afternoon and were tutored by the older ones and mother and dad. But dad seldom scolded for this offense. He was convinced that the low marks were merely an error of judgment on the teacher's part. That teacher must not know her business, he grumbled for mother's benefit. Imagine failing one of my children. Why, she doesn't even have the sense to tell a smart child from a moron. When we moved to Montclair, the business of enrolling us in the public schools was first on the agenda. Dad loaded seven of us in the Pierce Arrow and started out. Follow me, live bait, he said. I'm going to enjoy this. We're going to descend upon the halls of learning. Remember, this is one of the most important experiences of your life. Make the most of it and keep your eyes and ears open. Let me do the talking. The first stop was Nishiwani, the elementary school, an imposing and forbidding structure of dark red brick. At its front were two doors, one marked boys, the other girls. Frank, Bill, Lil, and Fred. This is your school, said Dad. Come on, in we go. No dying cow looks. Hold your shoulders straight and look alive. We piled out, hating it. You older girls, you older girls too, said Dad. We may, may as well make an impression. Oh no, Daddy. What's the matter with you? Come on. This isn't our school. I know it, but we may as well show them what a real family looks like. Wonder if I have the time to run home and get your mother and the babies. That was enough to cause the older girls to jump quickly out of the car. As we approached the door marked boys, the girls turned and started for the other entrance. Here, where are you girls going? Dad asked. This is the girls' door over this way. Nonsense, said Dad. We don't have to pay any attention to those foolish rules. What are they trying to do here anyway? Regiment the kids? Hush, Daddy, they'll hear you. Suppose they do. 
They're going to hear from me soon enough, anyway. We all, we all went in through the door marked boys. Classes already were in session, and you could see the children watching us through the open doors as we walked down the corridor to the principal's office. One teacher came gasping to the doorway. Good morning, miss, said Dad, bowing with a flourish. Just a Gilbert invasion, or a partial invasion, I should say, since I left most of them at home with their mother. Beautiful morning, isn't it? It certainly is, she smiled. The principal of Nishiwani was an elderly lady, almost as plump as Dad, and much shorter. She had the most refined voice in the Middle Atlantic states. Probably she was a very kind, gracious woman, but she was a principal, and we were scared of her. All but Dad. Good morning, man, he said with a bow. I'm Gilbreth. How do you do? I've heard of you. Only four of them enroll here, Dad said, nodding toward us. I brought the other three along so that you could get a better idea of the crop we're, we're raising. Redheads, mostly. Some blondes, all speckled. Just so. I'll take care of everything, Mr. Gilbreth, and I'm glad you dropped in. Well, wait a minute, said Dad. I'm not just dropping in. I want to meet their teachers and see what grades they're going in. I'm not in any hurry. I've arranged my schedule so that I can give you my entire morning. I'll be glad to introduce you to the teachers, Mr. Gilbreth. As to the classes they will enter, that depends on their ages. Hold on, hold on, Dad put in. Depends on age, yes. Mental age. Come here, Bill. How old are you? Eight, isn't it? Bill nodded. What grade do eight-year-olds usually belong in? The third, the principal replied. I want him in the fifth, please. The fourth, said the principal, but you could tell that she was beaten. Ma'am, said Dad, do you know the capital of Columbia? Do you know the population of Des Moines, according to the 1910 census? I know you do, being the principal. So does Bill here. So does little Jackie, but I had to leave him home. It's time for his bottle. The fifth, said the principal. After we were enrolled came the surprise visits that we used to dread, because Dad seemed to break all the school rules. He went indoors marked out, he went upstairs marked down, and he sometimes even wore his hat in the corridors. For any one of these offenses, a child might be kept after school for a week. For all three, he might be sent to reform school until his beard grew down to his knees. But the teachers always seemed to enjoy Dad's visits and the attention he gave them. And the principals, even the Nishiwani principals, principal, always were after him to speak at the school assemblies. If you had half the sense or the manners of your father or your mother, the teachers used to say when they'd scold one of us. Sometimes the class would be right in the middle of saluting the flag when in would burst Dad, with a grin stretching from ear to ear. Even the kindergarten children knew of the inflexible rule against entering a room while the flag was being saluted. No pupil would have dared to do so, even to spread an alarm of fire, monsoon, or the Black Plague. Yet there was Dad. The floor seemed to rock while you waited for Miss Bilsop to bear her fangs in spring. But instead, Miss Bilsop would grin right back at him. Then Dad would salute the flag, too, and you'd hear his deep voice booming over that of the class. One nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Everybody in school knew that the Lord's Prayer followed the salute to the flag. And after that, justice for all, you were supposed to sit down and bow your head on your desk with your eyes closed, waiting for the teacher to lead off with, our Father who art in heaven. And there was Dad. Good morning, Miss Bilsup, he'd say. Then, and this was the worst of all, Hello, Frank, G Frank Jr. I see you hiding behind that book. Sort of a surprise visit, eh? Hello, Shavers. Excuse me for interrupting you. I'm Frank Jr.'s father. I won't take up much of your teacher's time. Then she can get back to the lessons I know you love so well. The class would laugh, and Dad would laugh with them. He really loved kids. How was he getting along, Miss Bilsop? Once he called her Milksop by mistake and sent her a dozen roses later that morning as an apology. What's the story? Is he keeping up with his work? 
Does he need to study more at home? You're doing a fine job with him, and he's always quoting you around the house. Do you think he can skip the next grade? If he doesn't behave himself, just let me know. Dad would listen to Miss Vilsop for a few minutes, then drop you what drop you what might have been a wink, and burst out of the room again to go to the classroom of another Gilbreth child. Miss Vilsop would still be smiling when she'd turn to the class. Now, children, we will bow our heads, close our eyes, and repeat the Lord's Prayer. You'd wait anxiously for recess, knowing that you were going to have to fight if anyone so much as hinted that your father was a fat man or that he didn't know the school rules even as well as a kindergarten child. But instead, a couple of the kids would come up shyly and tell you, Gee, your old man is the cat's all right. He's not scared of anything. Yeah, you'd say. Sometimes you'd try to tell Dad after such a visit that his popping in like that was embarrassing. Embarrassing, he would ask, a little hurt. What's embarrassing about it? Then he'd sort of pinch you on the shoulder and say, Well, maybe it is a little embarrassing for me too, old timer. But you've got to learn not to show it, and once you've learned that, it doesn't matter anymore. The important thing is that dropping in like that gets results. The teachers lap it up. They did, too. Since Dad went to church only if one of us was being christened, in other words, about once a year, Mother had to carry the ball when it came to enrolling us in Sunday school. Dad said he believed in God, but that he couldn't stand clergymen. They give me the creeps, he said. Show me a man with a loud mouth, a roving eye, a fat rear, and an empty head, and I'll show you a preacher. Dad had crossed to Europe once on a liner carrying a delegation to a minister's convention. It was on this trip that he had acquired most of his distaste for the reverence. They monopolized all the conversation at dinner, he complained, and it was obvious that this was the real sin he could never forgive. They crawled out of every argument by citing, that, citing the Lord God Jehovah as their authority. I was asked on an average of eight times a day for eight miserable and consecutive days to come to Jesus, whatever that is. And a stewardess told me that her behind had been pinched surreptitiously so many times between Hoboken and Liverpool that she had to eat off a mantelpiece. Dad believed in Sunday school, though, because he thought everyone should have some knowledge of the Bible. The su successful man knows something about everything, he said. He used to drive mother and us to Sunday school and then sit outside in the car, reading the New York Times and ignoring the shocked glares of passing churchgoers. You at least might come in where it's warm, mother told him. You'll catch your death out here. No, dad replied. When I go to meet my maker, I want to be able to tell him that I did my praying on my own, halted by neither snow nor sleet nor icy stairs, and without the aid of any black frocked, collar back, collar backwards cheerleader. You might at least park where they won't, or they won't all see you. All the glares in Christendom won't force me to retreat, Dad said. Besides, I bet I have half the town praying to save my soul. Dad told Mother that the only church he'd even consider joining was the Catholic Church. That's the only outfit that, could give, that would give me some special credit for having such a large family, he said. Besides, most priests whom I have known do not appear to be surreptitious pinchers. Like this, said Ernestine, pinching Anne where she sat down. You stop that, said Mother, shocked. And turning to Dad, you're really going to have to watch the stories you tell in front of the children. They don't miss a thing. The sooner they know what to expect from preachers, the better, said Dad. Do you want to have them all eating off the mantelpiece? Although Mother always claimed that she liked church, she usually was ready to go home immediately after Sunday school. What's the matter, Lily? Dad would ask. Stay around a while. I'll take the children home and come back for you. No, I guess not this morning. You're not going to be able to get past St. Peter just in the strength of going to Sunday school, you know. Well, I'd be miserable up there anyway without you, Mother would smile. Come on, let's go home. I'll go to church next Sunday. Mother did take an active part in the Sunday school work, though. She didn't teach a class, but she served on a number of committees. Once she called on a woman who had just moved to town to ask her to serve on a fundraising committee. 
I'll be glad to if I had the time, the woman said, or I'd be glad to if I had the time, the woman said, but I have three young sons and they keep me on the run. I'm sure if you have a boy of your own, you'll understand how much trouble three can be. Of course, said mother. That's quite all right. And I do understand. Have you any children, Mrs. Gilbreth? Oh, yes. Any boys? Yes, indeed. May I ask how many? Certainly. I have six boys. Six boys, gulped the woman. Imagine a family of six. Oh, there's more in the family than that. I have six girls, too. I surrender, whispered the newcomer. When is the next meeting of the committee? I'll be there, Mrs. Gilbreth. I'll be there. One teacher in the Sunday school, a Mrs. Bruce, had the next to largest family in Montclair. She had eight children, most of whom were older than we. Her husband was very successful in business, and they lived in a large house about two miles from us. Mother and Mrs. Mrs. Bruce became great friends. Although a year, about a year later, a New York woman connected with some sort of national birth control organization came to Montclair to form a local chapter. Her name was Mrs. Alice Meebane, or something like that. She inquired among her acquaintances as to who in Montclair might be sympathetic to the birth control movement. As a joke, someone referred her to Mrs. Bruce. I'd be delighted to cooperate, Mother's friend told Mrs. Meebane. But you see, I have several children myself. Oh, I had no idea, said Mrs. Meebane. How many? Several, Mrs. Bruce replied vaguely. So I don't think I would be the one to head up any birth control movement in Montclair. I must say I'm forced to agree. We should know where we're going and practice what we preach. But I do know just the person for you, Mrs. Bruce continued and she has a big house that would be simply ideal for holding meetings. Just what we want, purred Mrs. Meebane. What is her name? Mrs. Frank Gilbert. She's civic-minded, and she's a career woman. Exactly what we want. Civic-minded, career woman, and most important of all, a large house. One other thing. I suppose it's too much to hope for. But is she by any chance an organizer? You know, one who can take things over and militantly drive ahead. The description, gloated Mrs. Bruce, fits her like a glove. It's almost too good to be true, said Mrs. Meebane, wringing her hands in ecstasy. May I use your name and tell Mrs. Gilbreth you sent me? By all means, said Mother's friend. Please do. I shall be disappointed if you don't. And don't think that I disapprove of your having children, laughed Mrs. Meebane. After all, many people do, you know. Careless of them, remarked Mrs. Bruce. The afternoon that Mrs. Meebane arrived at her house, all of us children were, as usual, either upstairs in our rooms or playing in the backyard. Mrs. Meebane introduced herself to Mother. It's about birth control, she told Mother. What about it? Mother asked, blushing. I was told you'd be interested. Me? I've just talked to your friend, Mrs. Bruce, and she was certainly interested. Isn't it a little late for her to be interested? Mother asked. I see what you mean, Mrs. Gilbreth, but better, better late than never, don't you think? But she has eight children, said Mother. Mrs. Meebane blanched and clutched her head. My God, she said, not really. Mother nodded. How perfectly frightful. She impressed me as quite normal. Not at all like an eight-child woman. She's kept her youth well, Mother conceded. Ah, oh, there's work to be done, all right, Mrs. Meebane said. Think of it, living right here within 18 miles of our National Birth Control Headquarters in New York City, and her having eight children. Yes, there's work to be done, Mrs. Gilbreth, and that's why I'm here. What sort of work? We'd like you to be the moving spirit behind a Mont Montclair birth control chapter. Mother decided at this point that the situation was too ludicrous for Dad to miss, and that he'd never forgive her if she didn't deal him in. I'll have to ask my husband, she said. Excuse me while I call him. Mother stepped out and found Dad. She gave him a brief explanation and then led him into the parlor and introduced him. 
It's a pleasure to meet, meet a woman in such a noble cause, said Dad. Thank you, and it's such a pleasure to find a man who thinks of it as noble. In general, I find the husbands much less sympathetic with our aims than the wives. You'd be surprised at some of the terrible things men have said to me. I love surprises, Dad leered. What do you say back to them? If you had seen, as I have, said Mrs. Kneebane, relatively young women grown old before their time by the arrival of unwanted young ones. And population figures show. Why, Mr. Gilbreth, what are you doing? What Dad was doing was whistling assembly. On the first note, feet could be heard pounding on the floors above. Doors slammed, there was a landslide on the stairs, and we started skidding into the parlor. Nine seconds, said Dad, pocketing his stopwatch. Three short of the all-time record. God's teeth, said Mrs. Meebane. What is it? Tell me quickly. Is it a school? No. Or is it? For Lord's sake it is. It is what, said Dad, asked Dad. It's your family. Don't try to deny it. They're the spit and image of you, and your wife, too. I was about to introduce you, said Dad. Mrs. Meebane, let me introduce you to the family. Or most of it. Seems to me like there should be some more of them around here someplace. God, help us all. How many head of children do you have now, do we have now, Lily, should you say offhand? Last time I counted, seems to me there was an even dozen of them, said Mother. I might have missed one or two of them, but not many. I'd say twelve would be a pretty fair guess, Dad said. Shame on you, and within eighteen miles of national headquarters. Let's have tea, said Mother. But Mrs. Meebane was putting on her coat. You poor dear, she clucked to Mother. You poor child. Then turning to Dad, it seems to me that the people of this town have pulled my leg on two different occasions today. How revolting, said Dad. And within 18 miles of national headquarters, too. And that is the end of Chapter 7. And tomorrow night we will continue with Chapter 8. Have a good night, everyone.